This episode of Conversations with a Wounded Healer contains the harsh realities of depression and suicide. Please listen with care. Hi there. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino. So a meditation student asks his teacher, am I allowed to send you email? Yes, replied the teacher, but no attachments, please. But um bum ch Haha, <laughs> just wanted to give you a little joke at the beginning of this commercial for Scott Tusa's Coming to Chicago. I've told you about it before, but I'll tell you again. Friday, October 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. There'll be a Dharma talk with a $20 suggested donation. And then on Saturday, October 27th, a half-day meditation intensive for $75 bucks or $95 bucks if you want CEU. So please visit my website at www.headhearttherapy.com and and you can find more information to purchase tickets and hopefully you can join us that weekend. So again, that is October 26th and 27th. We look forward to seeing you. Today's guest is a good friend of mine who I met through my therapist. I seem to meet a lot of wonderful people uh, who are six degrees separated from Susan Lipschitz. So Versanet blackman Bosia. She says she is passionate, creative, and a visionary with scrappy resilience. Her life's motto is, a broken wing doesn't mean that you can't fly. So please enjoy my interview with Versanet. Hi, Versanet. Hey, Sarah. How are you? I'm a little crazy right now, but that's okay. What's Girl, new? Crazy. <laughs> right? I mean... Who says who says they're fine or good anymore? They're liars. Uh totally. Like I definitely <laughs> don't. I used to go out of my way to say I'm good. I'm great. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. If if you're actually fine or good, you're not paying attention because there's a lot of shit going on. There's a lot of shit going on right now and it freaks me out so much. I'm like, how do you jumble all of that into one word that sums up how you're doing in a moment? Crazy. I can't really do it. Crazy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Crazy is not bad. It's not. <laughs> it's just truth. <laughs> That's all it is. And truth, mm -hmm. truth is one of those things. I'm like, yeah, you know, truth. Maybe that should be my answer when somebody asks me how I'm doing. You yeah. want truth? Right. Or you want me to, yeah. 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 That, yeah. Do you have space for do, reality do, or no? I do have a moment because mm -hmm. I could just tell you, like, uh, I'm really struggling right now with a whole bunch of things. Can you help me? Right. <laughs> And they're like, you know? nope. And you're like, okay, nope. next. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we before we go off in, into oblivion, as I know we will, how about you tell people who you are and what you do? All right. So I'm an artist, an author, a speaker, and a facilitator. Also a mom and a wife to five teenagers, blended family, my husband Ooh, girl. and I. Yeah. So my youngest two will be 18 and 20 this year. So I'm entering a season in my life where finally, I think it's all about me. So mm. those are all the roles. I run a business. It's called Soul Revival Healing Arts, and I sell original art. I've done a lot of exhibits in the community all over Chicagoland. Also, I am an author who published her first poetry collection. It's called Butterfly Spirit. God, the title's so long. Butterfly Spirit, Poems of Transparency, Transformation, and Truth. And so I am an artist and a healer and someone who really believes that art has such a tremendous capacity to heal. And mm -hmm. I've learned that through my own life. So, you know, that's who I am and what I do on so many levels. And I mean, I've got a lot of titles. I'm also a licensed massage therapist. So I'm, look, I'm an everyday medicine woman. <laughs> Braving the world Yay! right now. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Yeah. So, could you, if it's possible, because you mm -hmm. you are so many things at the same time, and everything sounds like it's kind of coming to an apex for you now. But can you kind of weave for us what your journey was and how you arrived here? Absolutely. So I was born a creative girl way back in the 70s. I always had so much imagination. I think I had way more imagination than anything else. It was having that active imagination, being surrounded by books and creativity. My dad was an artist, first artist I ever met, actually, completely 
gifted on so many levels. He could draw, he could sing, I mean, he could Mm -hmm. dance. And my mom was also pretty creative. She's got a real nurturing spirit. She made sure that we had all the books in the house. So I was the kid who spent my free time hanging out on the couch, looking up at the ceiling, pretending that the ceiling was actually the floor. (laughs) All right. Yeah, I read books from Time Magazine to Encyclopedia. I was always drawing and I was always dreaming. And so I'm a nature lover and artist and creative. And it took me until I was in my late 30s to actually realize that I am an artist. It's okay Mm. to give myself that title. And I had spent a lot of time in service jobs, basically from customer service to retail. I mean, I've worked pretty much everywhere and I've gone to a lot of schools. And the things I was most drawn to were psychology. I'm Mm -hmm. so fascinated by people's behavior and why we do what we do. Definitely a philosophy geek. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I like to have deep conversations all the time. Same, Uh same. Same, same. Yeah, I, it's just my way of connecting. It's the, it's the best way to like really get to know who I am by listening to what other people have to say. So I'm really into insight and meshing that with creativity and also helping other people overcome the same traumas that I've faced in my life. Mm. And that, my love, is a numerous list. First, I'm a survivor of sexual assault. There's one mm. thing that, you know, I think most people and organizations that I've worked with are aware of that because I'm a survivor turned advocate. But I spent about six, maybe about five and a half years actually working for a literary arts organization that's based in Evanston. And we did book groups. We went into mm. a lot of the underserved communities where there were at risk youth and we replaced one of their English classes simply by bringing literature to them and giving them books that they would then see themselves in and Mm. inviting them to have conversations about it. And so that job right there was one of the first jobs that I had that I knew I was made for. I knew Mm. that I was created for that. And so it was one of the most rewarding jobs I've ever had. It was also really draining for me because... Mm -hmm. Empathy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Empathy is one of my, it's one of my top five strengths on the strengths finder. So being in those classrooms with those youth, I mean, it was young men and women between the ages of as young as 11, all the way to like 20, 22. And so going in there armed with a book, a poetry prompt, some art, and just being willing to have authentic and honest conversations with them and asking them what they think was the thing that reminded me that, oh, I'm actually (laughs) the grown-up version of these teenagers from Chicago surviving Mm. trauma, and we need each other. So Mm. that was my journey. That was the first job that I had, and I learned so much about how a nonprofit works and fundraising, and when you're wanting to do great work in the community, you got to have a team. So from there, I actually left a couple of years ago and started my own business. That's where I'm at. (laughs) Mm. So talk a little bit about what your business encapsulates. Soul healing arts, is that the? Soul revival. Soul revival. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I remember starting my business and I was really caught up on the name. I love to name things. I'm super wordy. And, you mm. know, the writer in me is always like, what are we going to call this thing? So soul revival was born out of me realizing that I didn't just want to be a service provider in terms of creativity and healing. I wanted to also claim my own art and my own creativity just because it's something that I needed. I didn't realize that for a long time. I worked so many jobs and I was always the best greeter, the best customer service Mm -hmm, person. I mm -hmm. was always someone who was super ambitious. It was very easy for me to help other people and forget about myself Mm -hmm. and (laughs) see So it was the year that I actually graduated from massage therapy school. So I left my full-time gig. The first thing I wanted to do when I left my gig actually was start my own nonprofit to take the same same kind of programming, but just my own stuff mm-hmm. to domestic violence shelters. And that was really exciting. I, I mean, I'm an independent worker, so I'm mm-hmm. one of those people who has a hard time sometimes not being the leader. <laughs> Same, same. (laughs) I forgot how much we're sisters. (laughs) Yes, I forgot. I know, right. I'm like, 
oh my mm-hmm. god okay so i'm bossy you know and i take the initiative I'm like <laughs> right. so this is the problem who's gonna mm-hmm. do something okay i'm doing it yep so that's what i did i, I like jumped out of a full-time job and i knew that i'd already created so many connections that i could do exactly what i wanted to do but i needed help but let me tell you i was quickly worn out by all the things that go into a nonprofit from fundraising yeah. and all the administrative stuff. And I was like, okay, I have no money now. I'm yep. unemployed technically. How am I actually going to start a nonprofit? It's a little, yeah, it's too much for me. And so it was during that sort of intersection where I just, I was like, okay, so I do want to help people, nonprofit. That's a complicated way for me because you're always going to be subjected to funding. Yep. And I was like, why am I not, you know, and I've had a lot of great mentor women in my life who just, they would say to me, okay, so, you know, if you do a nonprofit at best, you're only going to be making this much and you're going to spend a lot of time making friends with the people and you may not always like them, but you can, and I was like, ah, oh, mm-hmm. I'm way too, look, I'm just, I'm pretty, I'm a direct communicator. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're too honest for fake friends. <laughs> yeah, I know about that. Can't really, yeah. Yeah, no. Plus, mm-hmm. you know, I had a family and, mm-hmm. and a husband who's worked to provide for us, but I mean, I'm like, let's be realistic i'm Mm -hmm. like we gotta eat right so it was a couple of months after that transition from a full-time gig and i went to an art retreat in north carolina and it was life-changing let me Mm. tell you i spent four days with some amazing women from all around the world just learning how to do art but it was an intuitive based approach Mm -hmm. which i had already been on that kick just from like researching and fighting people online i'm like oh my god i like what she's doing okay let me try this way let me try that way shop was life-changing. It was at Donna Downey Studios in Huntersville, North Carolina. And I'll never forget how I was in there and I was the only Black girl in that room. I'll never forget Hmm. that. But we would all gather together and have food and we would chat over art. And you know how it is. Anytime you're doing anything creative, you're like, let me see what you're making. All Mm -hmm. right, let me see what you're making. I made so many gorgeous friends. Oh my God. So they called me Chicago. Because that's how, you know, like, where are you from? I'm from North Carolina. Where are you from? I'm Chicago. Mm-hmm. Chicago, what you doing over there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, hey, girl, how was your night? This is what I'm doing. Girl, I was always the last artist to leave the studio with a couple mm-hmm. of other junkies. And I came home that weekend. And I, she, the thing about the beauty of that particular art workshop was that, first of all, it was super affordable. I was pretty much broke because I was getting, I think, unemployment and mm-hmm. you know, we were struggling. And I could do a payment plan. And I was able to use money that I had already raised for my own organization to take myself on an artist retreat, which mm. was, it made a lot of sense to me. I was like, this is why I've done the work that I'm doing, because I'm always going to want to help other people. But if I don't refill up my own well, if I don't refill the well in my heart, mm-hmm. it's a done deal. And it's it's interesting that you talked about, you know, the, the work that you did and how because you're so empathetic, mm-hmm. it was hard. And I was in Canada over this past weekend spending time with Gabor Mate, and he talked about compassion fatigue is not mm-hmm. because we've been giving too much compassion to others. It's because we've not been giving enough compassion to ourselves. So, so, so true. Oh, that's yeah. one of those things that's just like, oh, yes. Yeah. It's spot on. I really came away this weekend from this whole thing recognizing that, you know, sometimes I feel self-conscious about the the amount of self-care and and healing work that I do for myself. But when I came away this weekend, I was like, no, it's because I do that, that then I'm able to share with other people. And my my journey has to be the most important, not because, you know, my clients are less important than me or my staff is less important than me, but I cannot be the best version of myself. I cannot be a healer, a helper, a therapist, a mentor, a boss, unless I am working towards my best self. Yep. So it's exactly. almost like the helping work that I do now, I'm trying to frame it in this way that it's like it's this super positive byproduct of my own mm-hmm. work. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing about when I think about a super positive byproduct, it's so, you know, it's so hard for me to um, to just think of the work that we do in in those in those frame in, in a frame that way, because it's like what we put out into the world is good because it's not always positive. And yeah, that's mm-hmm. the, you know, that has been so hard for me to embrace, but I think art was the one thing that really helped me to embrace that because mm. it was the place where I could always go and just start putting some paint down. You know, I would scribble my anger out or whatever issues I was dealing with in my life. Mm. At that time, I was like, you know what? I don't know what else to do. Go make something. Mm. You know, let me write in my journal. Let me scribble. And these are things that always bring us back to the center and the whys of our work. So mm-hmm. we are always bringing out the most positive byproducts. I think without even, I think it's intentional, but it's, it also feels unintentional sometimes too for yeah. me in my journey. Yeah, yeah. I, it's the honesty. <laughs> it's the honesty part that's like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty authentic, but I'm also super transparent. Right. Right. It's hard for me to to fake when totally who I am. So yeah, Yeah. and I just I just can't. And you know, as you're talking, I'm I'm thinking, you know, the I think as we have done our own healing work, at least for me, and what I'm also kind of hearing in your story as well, is that, you know, the the path was already laid out. And I'm not saying like, oh, God, you know, God has a plan for us and we're supposed to do everything that God says. Not like that. No. But, yeah. but because we have begun to align with our higher selves, our true nature, the path just kind of falls into place. And... And I say that recognizing that it might sound like, oh, life's easy at that point. And I don't think that it's easy, but I think there is an ease to knowing which way I'm supposed to go. So I don't know if you if you resonate with that. Very much so. That's the only ease that I yeah. ever lean into. And, you know, I do feel like there is a plan that God has specifically for me. Mm-hmm. I do feel like I know exactly what my purpose is. And it is rooted in spirituality, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I grew up and you can relate. We we talked about this yeah. <laughs> as we were singing this little light of mine at, in mm. Toto Santos. Is that right? Toto Santos. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like when you grow up in an uber religious family, you have to make really hard decisions about what religion is going to mean for you. And grew up in a Baptist church, Southern, well, it's a missionary Baptist church in Chicago. It's over 106, 106 years old this year, actually. And so, you know, it's that's a family tradition. But there is at some point I realize I'm like, okay, I think that what I think God says it's a little different because this feels like judgment and condemnation, right? and that makes me feel like I'm bad. You know, right. I was really young understanding that. I was super young getting that part. Mm. And so for me, I call that grace. You know, the grace to walk through so many traumatic events in your life, but also understand that there's, look, there's the roots of the tree yeah. <laughs> and then there's the fruit of the tree. And right. so you can go back and like, take the best versions of what you've already been taught and let that be the foundation. So I'm like, yeah, this is the vision that is for my life is very much rooted in a deep love and spirituality that isn't about, you know, separatism and, you know, I'm better than you and we've got the answer and you don't and you Americans and you Christians and you Mm -hmm. are so over that shit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can't even, I'm like, well, you know what, then the same God who loves me enough to understand that I'm, you know, I'm going to use profanity. I'm like, uh, I'm like, I think, I think God already knows that about me. You're going to get angry sometimes. I don't think God gives a fuck what I say (laughs) as long as I say it with a happy heart, right? (laughs) It really does matter what's in your heart. That is so, so true. That's where the whole soul revival, that's where it was born. I didn't even know what to, I was trying to come up with all these super fancy names. I was like, maybe I should call it soul flower healing art. And I was like, you know, hold, why do I have to be a flower? Mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. So soul revival. 
it was a playlist that I had actually the name of a playlist on mm. Spotify and my best friend called me up one day and we had been talking I was like I don't know what I'm gonna name my business I'm doing art I just got my license for massage I want to help people I'm gonna do this I just wrote my book you know and she's like oh, don't overthink it that's what she says yep. to me all the time don't overthink it yep. she knows me I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then she called me one day and I said, girl, I'm over here listening to my Soul Revival playlist. And she was like, that's the name of your business right there. Well, and the word revival to me, aside from the religious context of having a good old spiritual revival. I um, know. <laughs> the, I <laughs> right? the other thing that conjures for me is the base word of it, which is revive. And if I think about those of us who have been through trauma and those of us who continue to reinvent ourselves, there is a revival and a revision, a revisiting of ourselves in different forms. And so I do think revival is a, is a beautiful word to talk about healing work. It really is. And I was got a little complicated. I mean, my business was pretty much born in 2014. And then 2015 is when I was like, all right, how do I actually make a business and all the things. But there was a while where I wonder why I was the only artist who didn't name my business Versinet Blackman Bosia Art or something like that. And I've just, you know, I realized that, it, and this is a, it's a weird sort of thing, the way I put a lot of work out into the world while understanding that it's not just about me, but whatever comes through that work will come through me. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, when you say revive in terms of like circling back and understanding that, mm -hmm. you know, you're gathering, you're always going to be gathering. Um, I mean, in terms of creativity, it's funny that a lot of people, especially adults, don't feel like they're creative at all. Right. You know? And that I never felt that way. I'm like, um, like, that's a shame. Sorry for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry. Like, I'm sorry mm -hmm. you feel that way. Like, how can I help you? You know, you can do and they will talk about I used to write poetry. I used to make art. And I'm like, you know what? Mm -hmm. So guess what? This is my soul revival. But you're welcome to come and find your own soul revival and healing mm -hmm. through art. And that, you know, that's that's an elevator pitch. I need to write that down because I forget well, sometimes. Well, <laughs> good thing that we're recording this because okay. you don't even have to write it down. <laughs> awesome. See, technology saves me again. Bam. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm... I'm realizing as we go through this, I usually kind of at the beginning start talking about how I know the guest and I didn't even do that with you. We just like launched into it. So um, do you do you want to share a little bit about our our adventure in Mexico? Oh, of course. It's my favorite story, actually, from Mexico. So the funny thing that really cracks me up sometimes is that um, because of our friends at Tribe, Carrie, mm -hmm. I think she had invited me to something in Chicago, and I don't remember what it was, but it was it was an event, and I remember looking at your face on something, and I was like, Head Heart Therapy. Hmm. I love that title, and I think she's going to be one of my best friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. Yes. And I think, I don't know if I reached out to you or whatever, but then we're at the retreat, I think, what, maybe a year or so, months later. And so as soon as I saw you at the retreat, I was like, hi, oh my God. I remember when I saw you on something online and I was like, we're going to be best friends. And you're like, okay. <laughs> okay, girl, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Yep. And so one of, I mean, that was an incredible retreat, first Oof, of all. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh so much about that and that for me was the first time i had gotten my passport first time right. i had actually traveled internationally mm -hmm. outside of going on a cruise and like sleeping on the land in a tp right next to the ocean in the gulf of Elk. girl it was right. amazing right and so one of the things that really cracks me up when i think about you is that we're very loud yep super authoritative and yep. bossy mm -hmm. super creative and honest to so honest and like sometimes it's a little much for people <laughs> just like yeah. you know what and I was like let's have some one-on-one -on -one time before we leave and I just remember like you were all tatted up just like me you had funky hair and style and you would wake up and be like hey good morning what's up and we cried together we sang together yeah. oh, 
our time together on the beach. We talked about our childhoods and all the things that we want to do in the world. That was like the point of healing and to sit there right next to the waves on the ocean. And it was just us opening our hearts. I was like, yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, I was right. She is my friend. This is my sister. So I don't know if it was the last night of the retreat, but I just remember that Susan made us sing. (laughs) Yeah. So we had our we had our ceremonial ritual white yes. clothing and we walked to have that fire. Yes. You and I were holding hands and we sang this little light of mine and I was like, Girl, you sing? We need to have a band. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. I mean, it was so, and I remember leaning in because your voice was so much stronger than mine. And I was like, I'm leaning in to keep the tones and the melody because you mm. got me. And we stood there holding hands, singing. And then Susan made me pray. So come on, put mm. a prayer out for the children. I was mm-hmm. like, okay, here we go. This mm-hmm. is, you know, and I remember that night it was so beautiful. And we had done so much spiritual work. And then that night also, just as the fire was going down, a couple of us stayed out. And I started, I picked up a drum. I can't even remember whose drum it was Hmm. must have been jessica huff who was doing our yoga yep she had that drum and i remember hitting that drum and i was like oh my god this is like calling up my own african roots actually Mm. i was like i need to have my own drum that trip gave me so much to help me overcome fear that i've had about not being able to swim, being close to the ocean, mm. all the things, understanding that my best friends are already in the wellness industry. You know, we're mm-hmm. healers, we're therapists, we're artists, we're nurses, we're doctors, we're social workers. I mean, we, this is what we do. So mm-hmm. that, I mean, it was a life changing trip for me. So yeah. 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 You, I'm very jealous of your memory. You have a really <laughs> good memory. I, I usually walk away from any experience not remembering details, but remembering just how I felt. And I just remember feeling so much love with mm-hmm. you and for you and um and and that like god i mean that was right after my parents that was literally right after my mom died that was only three months after and so i think i was in this emotional just broken place but then yep. at the same time i don't remember details anyway so <laughs> i'm i'm glad to like relive all this through you because it's, it's been you know it's in the recesses somewhere i have yeah. i really wish i could take song lyrics out of my head and put other mm-hmm. important important things like this in there because I can read that shit off an iPad now. Yeah. It's funny how uh, people always say that my memory is really, is just like, you have a really great memory. And I can't even begin to explain to you how, like, so I could literally put something down, get up the next minute. And I'm like, what happened to this? And what, Mm -hmm. you know, I can be super scatterbrained, like so much, but I think there's something that works really well when it's about connection and Mm -hmm. when it's really coming from a place of love, um, I get a visual. It's hard to explain, but I can see. But like, as I'm recounting that story and thinking about our connection and how it started, I'm like, I could see us there on the beach. I could see Mm -hmm, us when we went mm -hmm. for hikes and the fire and the drum and all of that. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think that's what helps me to translate everything into some form of visual storytelling because I'm a storyteller. I'm always going to be telling stories. So, I mean, song lyrics, look, I'm like, do you want to start a band? Because like... (laughs) No, I'm trying to get lyrics out of my head. All right. Then, look, I love it. I love I got it. You. Let's lean into the the question about being a healer because mm-hmm. you, you've already said that a couple times, you know, mm-hmm. in our interview here. So when you think about the work that you do, who you are, and the title of healer, how does that fit or not fit for you? So healer has been super complicated for me. Um, it depends on, you know, where I am in my own life. And so it's, it's interesting that you brought up the fact that when we were sitting out on the sand that day that, you know, your mom had just passed away. So you were grieving and grief is one of those complicated things that I've never fully understood mm-hmm. until I just lost my brother a year ago to suicide. Mm-hmm. And he was only 32 years old and he took his life in my mom's bathroom while I was in New York on my way to an art show. So the level of helplessness, yeah, ugh, indescribable, indescribable. And so thinking about brokenness and also how, how does a healer deal with brokenness? The only thing I've ever known, 
tell the truth about how you feel. Mm-hmm. You know, I was fortunate to be able to speak with him just a couple of days before he actually took his life. And I knew he wasn't well. And so my mom had called me and she said, you know, I need you to talk to your brother because I think he's not doing well. And it's funny that I don't have a degree, but I'm pretty much the therapist in my family. Mm-hmm. Who was like, we need you to talk to our girlfriends. You need to talk to your niece, your nephew. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, hey, hey. Who's okay. going to pay me for this? Who's right? <laughs> Why? Like, why am I working for free if I've mm-hmm. already survived the family? So, um, you know, one of the last things that I did last year in my business, and this is where I got stuck, was I released a collection called This Is Grace. And it was all about me exploring my own grief and understanding that if anything is actually going to sustain me right now with all this pain and everything else I've already gone through, it has to be grace, you know, and not the kind of grace that I can give to myself or anybody else, but it's just it's grace that'll sustain me until I get through this. So it's been complicated because that led to so many other domino effect things in my life. Like it literally, you know, I'm also lost my brother to suicide, had to circle back, take care of the family, raising, you know, five teenagers who Mm -hmm. like, you know, being married, making sure that my business stays afloat, all of that led to a psychotic break in December. And so in the winter, I, I knew I was exhausted, But I kept trying to go on because I got this show and I got to do this and trying to hold on to all the roles. So that was when I think I lost faith in myself as being a healer. So I was like, Mm -hmm. you know what? I think that maybe I'm not. Maybe this isn't Soul Revival Healing Arts. Maybe it's Mm -hmm. just art. It's too complex for me to even think about me being some sort of superior God. I'm like, no, I'm a believer. But sometimes when you say healer, it it denotes a superiority. Mm. So it's like, oh, you're a healer, but you smoke cigarettes. Oh, you're a healer. Mm. So you don't eat green this and you're not trying to save the planet. Oh, you're a healer. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Does that mean that I'm supposed to be perfect? Because there's no such thing. Hmm. So, you know, this is the thing I love about Susan's work is everyday medicine woman modern mm-hmm. medicine woman mm-hmm. so maybe the medicine is what brings healing to me and sometimes the medicine is the last thing you want to deal with yep own shit <laughs> you, know? you know and so i'm like creativity for me is medicine because I, it's the only thing that i know that brings me back to a place of freedom and helps me to embrace all the ugly stuff that I don't want to look at. I'm like, Mm -hmm. "Um, you know, I still got to deal with it. So I am a healer. I know that. Um, I just took me a long time. This, this last six months of my life has just been so, (laughs) Oh, it's been a journey, Sarah. Let me tell you. It's Mm -hmm. been a journey. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I want to go back to what you said about there being kind of an essence of superiority with the word healer, because a lot of people have have really pushed that word away. And I think that that's that's the assumption, right, is that, you know, I am healing you versus I am a, a vessel, a conduit, you know, whatever. But it's that's it. Superiority. That's really what I think the fear is. Either we're perceiving ourselves in that superior light or Mm -hmm. others are putting that on us. And it's, yeah, that comes down to power, right? Who holds the power? Yeah. Right. Yes, absolutely. Who holds the power? And I think that's especially salient given all the shit that's going on in the world and Mm -hmm. specifically our country. Yep. And what's funny is that I've always tried my best to shy away from politics Mm -hmm. and religion in terms of any sort of debate or any difficult conversation. Mm -hmm. Because I know it's a great entry point for offense. Yeah. And I'm like, "Uh, I don't know if you really want to know how I feel or how I think. And I'm not going to put myself in a box. But ultimately, I learned I've learned this the hard way. First of all, I actually am super interested in politics, Hmm. super interested in studying more about religion, world religion, and I actually love sports. So I've defied a lot of stereotypes by being myself. Yes, girl, I used to play basketball in in grammar school. I didn't even remember that shit, which is so funny. Wow. My memory is, my mom had to remind me recently. She's like, remember I used to play basketball? And I was like, oh my God. Huh. 
I forgot. And because, you know, I get super jazzed when it's the playoff season. I'm, like, literally standing in front of the TV and acting like I'm on the team. Clearly not an athlete, but, Eh. like, (laughs) I love sports, actually. I've been looking at those three areas lately a lot and just wondering, like, what is the thing with power dynamics? Like, what's really going on here? Mm -hmm. You know what my most basic answer is? That this is a revelation I just had this morning. All boils down to money, unfortunately, for some people. Which is power. I'm so conflicted on accepting that as it's really, it trips me up every time. Cause I'm like, is money power? Cause I thought knowledge was power and isn't wisdom like what, you know, true power. But Mm. I think when we're talking about what's going on in the country right now, it's fueled by fear and scarcity about not having enough resources, i.e. money. And if you have resources, i.e. money, you have the power in our society. And you and I, and I think probably everybody listening to this podcast agrees that that knowledge is power, connection is power, authenticity is power, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't get us paid. And I find it increasingly hard to live the life that I want to live and and reconcile with the way everybody else is living their life. And I'm not, I don't want to be like us and them. Right. Cause I'm I'm trying, but I think there's a large faction of people who are motivated mostly by success and money from a, you know, financial standpoint. And that's, I can't, I can't live that way. I can't either. I can't. And it's using the word faction brings me right back to what I love most about Brene Brown is that she tells her story in such a way that is like, it's her, it's her voice, it's her work, and that's it. And so one of the things that really helped me understand what I was struggling with was to go back and like get, I'd already read Brave in the Wilderness, but I went and and downloaded it on Audible. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, factions, that's it, from Divergent. We're factions. (laughs) It kind of sucks, but... It's true. Mm-hmm. It's very true. Like we're we're in these factions based on whatever our value systems are. Mm-hmm. You know, we forget core values a lot of times, and this is that's why I'm like, eh, politics is not a not a career I'd ever pursue. You know, I I believe way too much in the first and second amendment <laughs> rights, and I need to speak and use mm-hmm. my voice. You know, so it's an interesting thing when I really think about, you know, when I learned power dynamics, I thought to me, I liken it to the continuum of healing or the continuum of violence. You know, I took the 40 hour DV training. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, like it all boils down to control and manipulation. One of the first things where it starts and I'm like, okay, so it's unsafe to use computers these days things are going on everybody's looking for opportunities it's driving me nuts oh my god (laughs) what am i gonna do here so uh, yeah it's a it's an interesting thing when i think about how how do we how do us how do us healers (laughs) how do we women who are you know, doing everything we can to give back to the communities that we know are struggling. How do we use our voices while at the same time Mm -hmm. we're being told we're not good enough, you know, Mm -hmm. you and your feminist this and that, and, you know, this hashtag, this thing that, and I'm like, okay. It's hard for me to believe that every man I've ever walked or crossed paths with actually believes that. I know there's plenty of men who happen to be feminists also. Mm -hmm. I'm so over the power dynamic that I tend to go back to relying on the most authentic spiritual connections that I know from my work that help me to remember who I am mm-hmm. and what I do. So shifting from, you know, the the concept of healer, and it sounds like you knew you were a healer on some level, and then it felt like maybe there was some imposter going on and like, no, maybe I'm not a healer. Maybe that's just too hard. And then coming out the other side of it, recognizing that you are in fact a healer and that you want to own that word and continue to to spread that message. Absolutely. And You know, I think you already talked a lot about the wounded parts of yourself, right? Like losing losing your brother. Like I can't, we have enough suicide in in our family, but it's been members of my family that were further away from me. And Mm -hmm. and I can only, yeah, I I remember seeing that on Facebook and my heart just broke into a trillion pieces. 
Yeah. Suicide is one of the things that I used to write poems about it when I was a teenager. And I think that's as far as I would ever allow it to go. But that doesn't mean I've never had a suicidal thought in my entire life. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to have these sort of thoughts of dread when I was younger. I was always worried. So when you talk about fear and scarcity, I'm like, that's exactly, you know, what I've already overcome in my life. I'm like, okay. I used to think things are so bad. Maybe it's just easier to be dead because this is like Mm -hmm. really scary. Like I'm getting Mm -hmm. bullied at school. There's violence in my house. There's so many things going on in my neighborhood, in my school. I'm, you know, there's racism. I mean, Mm -hmm. dealing with all of that stuff. And I was like, maybe it'd be easier to be dead. And so for me to work so hard on my own, just working through my own trauma in the way that I have and to get to a place where, you know, my baby brother, who's he's like, he was eight years younger than me. And he was 32 last year. And so I'm like, he was so tired already. Yeah. Like he felt like he didn't have any other options. And yep. thank God I got to speak to him just a couple of days before he died because I said, hey, you know what? <laughs> Ironic about Wounded Healer. I said, listen, it's your time. You can't help other people. You can't worry about your girlfriend and the drama and all the things you're going through. Babe, you got to focus on you. You got to be, you got to find healing for yourself. Mm. You know, and he listened, but he listened with that same sort of pride and resistance and resentment that comes from being a younger brother to an older sister who doesn't play that shit. Right. <laughs> so, right. So he'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and then mix that mm-hmm. with religion. So he's like, yeah, in Jesus name. And I'm like, OK, you can cool all that shit out right now because you don't have to do that with me. But he was it's a little spiritual bypassing, too. I it think. just was a dark, dark place for him. And I think he allowed too many dark things to come in. Yeah. So I got to tell you a verse like the thought of my brother hurting himself is my number one fear. That is my number one fear in my mm. life. And because suicide runs in the family, I'm not a crazy person for having that fear, right? Mm-mm, not at all. Not and at all. I remember as a child, I can't remember if I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I remember wanting to kill myself as a child too. I don't think I really knew what that meant, but mm-hmm. I knew my mom's sister had killed herself right before I was born. And so I knew the emotional reaction that would happen. And I think because I was in so much pain and I didn't feel like anybody was recognizing my pain and validating it, I think I wanted to cause pain. And I, okay. this is, I'm not necessarily, I don't think that this was your brother's deal, but just, just kind of reflecting on my own story. Yeah. Like yeah. a five-year-old should not, A, should not know what suicide is and B, should not feel that way. You know, so like obviously something was going on in that house Mm -hmm. that I was reacting to and uh, I'm just glad I have moved beyond that place. You know, it's interesting that we're having the conversation about being wounded healers and and understanding like I, I think there's something so fascinating about being five and having that sort of um plate where you're the yeah. way you're looking at life in the world it sounds it's so to me there's a maturity in that mm. that I can mm-hmm. totally connect to and identify and it makes me feel like we are usually the ones who are called to this path and this work because yeah. we're like we're like born old old souls you know what I mean yeah and, well we're like feeling it feeling it when nobody else is yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah and, and I can tell you for sure, you know, with my brother, I can definitely identify just with his personality. And I mean, he was, you know, my baby too. Yeah. I basically helped raise him. There is something about the way his personality was and his overall feeling and his place in the family that definitely mm. was always looking for validation and mm-hmm. was someone who would inflict pain if he didn't feel like he received that. Mm. And so wow. suicide right now is running rampant. And God, so right? it's right. It's just, God. it just really is. And like, just death period that I feel like yeah. there's so yep. many, like 
all of my friends' parents are dying or people are committing suicide. I say this not in a derogatory way, but there's some sort of cleansing right now that I think is happening. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that it's people that aren't supposed to be here, but I think that it's people who've done their work and mm -hmm. or we're not going to be part of the awakening of consciousness to kind of take this planet to the next level. And I, again, that's not a derogatory thing. Like, I don't want anyone to think that I'm like, well, it's like the purge. Like, fuck these people. They, we didn't need yeah. them anyway. <laughs> no. But. No, don't, I mean, who has the right to even say that? But, right. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. Um, I feel like there's definitely a planetary universal spiritual shift happening in the whole world mm -hmm. and I just feel like there's there's shifts happening and those are very mm -hmm. real and I feel like there are some people whose journey has come to completion and then there's some yeah. who don't have anything to offer to the next part for themselves mm -hmm. or for anyone around them and so mm -hmm. it feels very much like I'm choosing not to be a part of this anymore I can right. definitely say with my brother you know, he was tired. He, right. you know, was probably someone who was an undiagnosed mental illness. Mm -hmm. And by the time we realized that it was just too late and he yeah. was already at the brink of, you know, like he was already gone, already at the point of psychotic break. Mm -hmm. And, and then there was so much anger and so much unresolved pain that he just had been carrying. Mm -hmm. And like I said, he played with the dark side a lot. Yeah. And I think that all of that, and you couple that with exhaustion and then feeling probably rejected and just not good enough. Yeah. All of that compounds and he, re he refused treatment when my mom mm. wanted to take him. She, you know, she asked me, I said, I think you should definitely take him. He refused treatment. And so at that point, mm. what can you do? This is an adult who's saying, you know, very angrily, I might add, no, I don't want that. That's not going to be for me. That's not for me. I don't want help. So, yeah. you know what I'm saying? What can yeah. you then do from that point? Mm -hmm. And that feels like from a spiritual place, there was a part of him who was opting out. And again, like, mm -hmm. I know that you're hearing what I'm saying, but I just kind of want to make sure that listeners understand that, that this is in no way a judgment. I think that for me, it's a way that I make sense of awful things happening is to give some sort of like reason to it that makes sense to me that makes me feel better and I don't care whether it's like <laughs> right or wrong mm -hmm. but it's a way for me to be at peace with you know wonderful people leaving this earth for in the way that I feel is maybe too early but for them clearly it was right on time yeah I mean I, I think that's fair I feel like it, we can only speak our own truth and I've yeah. had to <laughs> I've had to come up with many different ways of dealing with this mm -hmm. loss. And I, I mean, yeah. I still am, you know, where I knew him very well, but there was parts of him that I did not know that I feel like I came to terms with in, you know, a way that I'm still recovering from, but yeah. grief takes a long while and it's only been a year. So, you know, I try yeah. to give myself some grace in that, in that instance. And just speaking from the place of, you know, grieving for my parents, well, really, honestly, most of it has been grieving for myself mm -hmm. because there's been grief of, you know, what I didn't get, you know, it's been almost four years since my mom died and her, mm -hmm. her birthday is coming up and I've been getting messages all over the place that I need to ask her for forgiveness. Mm. And I remember actually at the retreat in Mexico was the first time my heart embraced the idea of forgiving my parents and, and believing that I am who I am because of them, not in spite of them. Mm. And so now, four years later, I think it's time for me to ask for forgiveness for not being as graceful or kind as I could have been. And, and I've been very judgmental of my mom and, and just, and it, it's all out of grief. It's all out of this desire for her to have been someone that I needed her to be, mm -hmm. but that wasn't her journey on this earth. Like she has her own higher power and soul's path with that. And so 
Yeah, I don't really know what I'm going to do with that yet, but I see Susan on Thursday, so I'm going to ask her what I'm supposed to do. (laughs) (laughs) Good. That's what she's there for. That's so awesome. First of all, I feel like we all grieve for selfish reasons, no matter what they are. Yeah. The grief is just, it's a very complex process. Yes. It's definitely a process. And I mean, it, it takes time. And I had no idea because, I mean, I lost my dad when I was 17, but mm. like I did not shed a single tear at his funeral because hmm. I was angry, yeah. you know, and yeah. I was just like, you know, you never gave me enough anyway. And how dare yeah. you leave me this young? And so over time in counseling and therapy, I had to really work through that and also forgive him. So I've totally been there. I understand how hard that is. And I used to, you know, write him letters. I mean, I'm yeah. it's something that I, you know, in every stage of my life, I feel like I have to revisit it. You know what I mean? There's yes. a return. There's, yes. a, there's mm-hmm. growing older and saying, okay, so in this part of my life, I wish you had, you know, been here for this. And I mean, I mean, I have kids that he's never going to meet grandkids mm-hmm. and he's never going to meet my husband or, yep. you know, see the woman I've become. So I think there's stages to all of that stuff. So I mean, I, I think that's awesome to realize, you know, I can grieve, but I can also realize it's for selfish reasons. And then the thing with suicide and my brother, it's been really surreal. Honestly, I'm still Mm -hmm. unpacking this and I really want to write about it. And it's, this is what's so terrifying is that I did not grieve properly when he passed away originally. Hmm. I went right into caretaker mode. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> so I was in New York and I was getting ready for a show there. And then he took his life and I had to come home. And I mm. happened to call just to check in on him and them while it was happening, which is, mm. again, really freaky. You know, I called and he's like in his the bathroom and it's really, mm. really Shit. tragic. And yeah. And so... You know, I'm screaming through the phone and the, the police are there and I'm telling them, oh I'm like, get God. them, you know, get him out of the bathroom. And just two days prior, I had said to my mom, you know, you need to take him in for an assessment and let them see what's going on. There's something. I don't know what it is. Yeah. I said, but I feel like it's going to get violent. And I said that mm. out of nowhere. And I was like, be careful, mom. I just have a feeling. Yep. And she said, OK. And so, you know. Even on the plane to New York, there was just this uneasiness. And so you could say on so many levels that I, like I knew intuitively, I felt something was really wrong and off, but I just didn't expect this to be the case. And so immediately I like canceled my show. I flew home to be with my family and my mom and my brothers. And, you know, this was also in the middle of a time where my business was really thriving. So I had a bunch of shows and my solo exhibit at Chicago Mindful had just been the month before, like a couple Mm -hmm. of weeks before that, actually. And so I was supposed to do a workshop there. Yeah, which was, you know, was creativity is soul work. And if that was the day we ended up having his funeral. And so I know. So it's just so many things. But I was there for everybody else in the family. And I didn't really take time for myself. Now, I knew that I wasn't okay. I knew that I was, you know, really sad and super depressed all summer long. Mm -hmm. But there were so many transitionings happening. Mm -hmm. So our kids, so we're a blended family, you know, so our oldest daughter graduated from high school. So we had to fly down for her graduation the week after the funeral. And then we come home, we've got all the teenagers here. You know, I'm still trying to work and like when I'm not numbing out, you know, it's so I kind of delayed my own process. Yeah. And by December, I got really, really sick. Started with high blood pressure and heart pain and mm. then it, chronic inflammation in my back. I have scoliosis with metal rods. So Mm. then insomnia hit and that all led me into a psychotic break Mm. where I just, it's almost as if I was on the other side of life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. And so I, I didn't, you know, this was something that I was like, that can't happen to me. And I was in denial. And, you know, my husband's like, you're not okay. You're not sleeping. I'm taking you to the hospital. So by January, I ended up spending a whole week in the behavioral health hospital, Mm -hmm. which, you know, it was eye opening. 
<laughs> because yeah. I mean, what a journey. And, you know, that every doctor that I've seen since then, you know, has said to me, you have to pause and give way to the fact that you're grieving, you know, mm-hmm. such a big loss. And then there's exhaustion and then you mm-hmm. have kids and a business and all the things. And so I've had to slow way down this year, Yeah, <laughs> which is just I'm learning a lot about myself, but I didn't really know much about mental health, I should say, Mm -hmm. from a personal perspective. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, now I feel like I've walked on the inside of what my brother's chemical imbalance was. Mm -hmm. And thank God I have the tools, you know what I mean, to apply, but... (laughs) And that's the, not all. And the willingness to ask for help. I mean, that's, that's what it is. That's mm-hmm. the big difference that I hear. And I mean, you and I have talked before about our frustrations with the mental health system mm-hmm. and, and that it's mm-hmm. not it's not always as supportive. But it sounds like you took from it what you needed to create stabilization again. You know, the thing is, I'm sort of... Uh different in that I hang out with therapists like my a lot of my Mm -hmm. friends are either psychotherapists Mm -hmm. social workers um, health and wellness practitioners energy workers so I've got like a whole gamut of amazing people in my life who I can always say listen I need help on this who really helped me to come back to myself so Mm -hmm. I mean I've I have been extremely fortunate I have to say because the system is broken and it's yeah. not an easy fix, but like, no. <laughs> you know, but, but there's, there's work that we do for ourselves. And then we're also coming back to the table to see what we can then offer to other people. So, so yeah. yay us, you know, yeah, <laughs> seriously. Well, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you think you want to share with listeners today? Um, oh, Yes, I am starting a Soul Revival Wellness channel on YouTube. Oh, fun! Yeah, so I really, I love video and you know I love to talk. Hey. Um, So I would just invite people to, you know, go look that up on YouTube and subscribe. Awesome. I'm doing weekly videos about all things, you know, health and wellness, mental, mental, emotional, and, and of course, lots of creativity and just some straight talk. So I'll be reading some poems and just talking about the journey. So awesome. yeah, I'd love to have people follow me there as well. Okay. Well, I'll make mm-hmm. sure to get that link from you so we can post it with the airing of this podcast. Awesome sauce. Yeah. Well, yeah. Verse, thank you. Thank you, sister. Oh, thank you. This is such a safe and cozy space. So, I mean, I absolutely adore you and... You're so badass, and I feel Mm. just honored to be in in kinship with you, seriously. (sighs) That feeling is mutual. Yay! (laughs) I hope you enjoyed that interview with Versanet. First, thanks you so much for joining me on Conversations with a Wounded Healer. And as always, thanks to Andrea Clunder and Edwin Ruiz at the Creative Imposter Studios for their editing, Liam O'Donnell for the album art photo, and Ben Mueller for our theme music. For more information on Versanet, you can visit my website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on Spotify or iTunes, Google Play or Stitcher, and you can connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time. Bye-bye.